Um, okay, um, so I, I'll just start off by thanking the organizers for inviting me here and uh, giving me the opportunity to present my work. Um, I'm going to be talking about cognitive control um, in language production. Um, and I'm going to do so both from the neurodevelopmental disorders perspective, but also from individual differences. Um, so I've been working on language production and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder for about uh, five, five or six years now. Um, and we've really looked at a range of topics with this particular group. So we've looked at um, sentence production, both in terms of grammaticality and disfluencies produced. Um, we've also looked over the lifespans. We've looked at children, adolescents, and adults who have this disorder. Um, and so I have an example um, here from one of Rosemary Tannock's papers. Um, and so, actually, I'm going to stand back here so I can read this. So a child with ADHD says, what are we going to do next, huh? What's in there? What's that? And the experimenter um, replies, you'll see in a sec, and the child interrupts, and the child says, where's the, um, the things, um, where's the um, bugs? And the experimenter says, pardon? What bugs? There are no bugs in here. Now tell me what. And the child responds, the bugs. You said I'll see the bugs. I don't want to do this. I want to see the bugs, the um, sex, the insects. And so I think you can see here it's difficult to work with these children, but also the thing that stands out to me is the number of disfluencies that are produced um, in this tiny little snippet. Um, and so I should maybe say just as a bit of background that um, the prominent theories of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder assume that it um, is due to deficits in inhibitory control. And um, quite surprisingly, um, the symptoms of impulsivity and the symptoms of hyperactivity are a in to a large extent um, defined by inappropriate language output. So you have things like blurting out answers before questions have finished, frequently interrupting or intruding in conversations, making comments out of turn, talking excessively. So these are the characteristics of this particular disorder. So it's really a, a large extent defined by inappropriate language outputs. Um, so in the first study that I want to tell you about, it was published in Memory and Cognition. And so in this study, we used a patient population to investigate a theoretical question in language production. So we took a clinical population, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which is assumed to involve deficits and in inhibition. And our research question is, does the production system rely on inhibitory control to minimize incorrect speech plans and disfluencies? Um, and in general, disfluencies like pauses and corrections are assumed to be due to some kind of production difficulty. And so I'm going to start off by talking about three types of disfluency. Uh, three types of disfluency. Okay. Um, so the first one's filled pauses. And so an example is, uh, that's a good question. And so the idea with filled pauses is that the speaker is going to experience a delay in what it is that they're going to say. Um, and so they produce the filled pause to send a signal to the listener like, hang on a second, I'm, I'm going to experience a delay here. The second one is repetitions. And so an example of a repetition is something like near Saint, near Saint Isaac's Cathedral. So the idea here is that the speaker suspends, articula uh, suspends articulation mid-utterance and then repeats something that they just said. And the idea with, these ty with this type of disfluency is that the speaker is going to restore continuity to the constituent that was interrupted. And the last one is repairs. These are sometimes called false starts. And so an example here is turn left, uh, right on palace embankment. So here you're getting the, getting the antonym. The speaker meant to say right, but they actually said left. And so these are cases where the, the speaker just simply produced the wrong word. Um, and just as a bit of background, I'll just give a, the sort of traditional model of language production. So it's generally assumed to involve three, three main stages, conceptualization, formulation, and articulation. And this um, system generally is a, um, has to take a non-linguistic thought and sequentially elaborate it lexically, syntactically, and phonologically in the course of speaking. And as the phonological plans um, are produced, they're stored in a buffer for a short time before they're passed on to the articulators. And the model um, is assumed to involve some kind of a monitoring system. So this model um, would assume that you use the language comprehension system to monitor your own speech plans before 
um, you say them, and if there's some problem with those speech plans, then an interruption has to occur in a correction. So just um, in the, this first study that I'm going to tell you about, um, our, our prediction is, is if this system relies on inhibition, then participants with ADHD should produce more disfluencies. Um, and so we used a task that involved priming, and on each trial, participants saw two pictures and a verb, and their task was to produce a sentence. One of the pictures was animate, one picture was inanimate. So a, per a participant might see a sequence like this, um, and this moved is an example of an ambiguous verb, and so if the participant sees this sequence, they're likely to produce um, a sentence like, uh, the man moved the chair. If you get the reversed order where you see the, the, the inanimate picture first, you're going to be more likely to produce a passive sentence, right? So the, the idea is that the, the first picture that's presented is the one that's more activated. And so in this case, the participant should be more likely to produce a passive, the chair was moved by the man. We also looked at participle verbs. Participle verbs have a tendency to occur in passive. So in this case, if participants see the inanimate picture first, they should be more likely to produce a passive sentence like the bicycle was ridden by the girl. Um, and if you get the reverse case, where you get the animate picture first, this is going to bias you to produce a past participle sentence, so something like the girl had ridden the bicycle. And what we found is, is that generally the participle verbs um, result in more errors because they have fewer syntactic options as compared to the ambiguous verbs. So this past participle there. Um, and so in this study, we had nearly 200 participants. Um, we've got typically developing controls, um, and we've got two different types of ADHD. So we've got one group that's ADHD primarily inattentive. So these individuals have elevated symptoms of inattention. We've also got the combined subtype. So the ADHD combined subtype has symptoms of both inattention and hyperactivity impulsivity. We also have two within subjects variables. We've got whether the animate or inanimate picture is presented first, and we've got two types of verbs. Um, and so, so this study produced a corpus of about 7,000 sentences, and we ended up with nearly 700 disfluencies. And so this, let me orient you to this graph. We've got the different types of disfluency along the X, and on the Y we have um, the proportion of sentences with a disfluency. And what you can see from the number of filled pauses is that there's clearly no difference between the three groups. Um, when we look at repetitions, you start to see this trend in which the ADHD participants are producing more than the control participants. Um, and then finally, we, what we see with repairs is that repairs are much more common um, in overall. And then we also now we get a group effect where the ADHD combined subtype is producing significantly more repairs than the controls and the primarily inattentive subtype. So when we look at this in terms of the within subjects conditions, we see this same pattern and we actually get significant differences when the inanimate picture is presented first and the verb is ambiguous. So this is the condition that's um, biasing you to produce a passive when we know that actives are in, in general much more common. We also see significant differences in the case where the animate picture is presented first um, and the verb is a, is a participle verb. And so this is the condition that's biasing you to produce a past, um, past participle sentence. You get a similar trend over here, although this one's not significant. So on the, in the, on the basis of these results, um, we concluded that preventing repair disfluency relies on inhibitory control, and it's in particular when the animacy and the verb biases conflict with one another. And we only get the effect um, with the combined subtype. We think that this actually makes sense because th these individuals have elevated symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity, and that's the, that's the symptom domain that involves inappropriate language output. So these individuals have problems with motor, motor control and behavioral outputs. Um, and so this was really the, the, uh, a study that got us thinking a lot more about what other individual differences variables might be important in language production, right? So things like executive function and intelligence. So the, the most common executive functions are inhibition, set shifting, 
and updating working memory. And these things are generally assumed to be low-level cognitive control variables that support many other higher, higher level type processing. Um, we also looked at um, intelligence, and here we just sort of assumed that intelligence um, represents um, the functioning of more broad-based neural networks as compared to executive functions. So executive functions are um, low-level control variables um, functions, and intelligence is just essentially um, a broader measure of, of neural functioning overall. So what we did in this second study that I want to tell you about is we created a test battery that, um, can, that looked at two executive functions and we also looked at intelligence. So we had two tasks um, to, to assess inhibition, the stop signal task and the Stroop task. We also had two tasks to look at set shifting. Um, so here we have Wisconsin card sorting task and we looked at the number of perseveration errors and we also um, used the trail making task. Finally, um, we used three subtests from the Weschler Intelligence Scale um, to, in order to assess intelligence. And if anybody has any questions about these specific tasks, you can ask me in the, in the question, uh, question session, section. Um, these are pretty standard neuropsychological measures. Um, so in this study, we had 106 community recruited volunteers, and it was the same task as the previous study. So see two pictures and a verb, and your task is to produce a sentence. Um, and in this case, we actually looked at four different disfluency types. We looked at filled pauses and also silent pauses or, or unfilled pauses um, and repetitions and repairs. Um, so to investigate this data, we used a latent, um, a latent variable approach. So I'm not sure if people are familiar with this, but, but these types of models um, have several advantages given the goal of the, of the research question that we started out from. So the latent variable essentially extracts um, variance across several variables. Um, so it, it helps you deal with task impurity issues. Um, it also, you're in, when you build this type of a model, you're, you can allow the, the latent variables to correlate with one another. These are the double-headed arrows. And then also the measurement error is kept separate from the latent variable. So what we did is we created this model and we assure, ensured that this model fit our data well. And then what we did was we added the disfluency variable. So we add the disfluency variable over here, and if we want to know whether or not disfluency production is related to any of these individual differences um, factors, we draw um, a line over to the disfluency, and we again want to ensure that this model fits the data well. And then what do we do is we, sit, we go in, and if you set this pathway equal to zero, and you check to see whether or not the model fit significantly decreases. So conceptually, what you do is you build a model that fits the data well, and you start breaking it systematically. And if you set one of these pathways equal to zero, and you get a significant reduction in model fit, then it suggests to you that there's unique and important variance along that pathway. And so following up from the finding on the previous study, um, with respect to repair disfluencies, um, we confirmed that result. So these are just um, typically developing individuals. And indeed, if you put repairs over here and you set the pathway from inhibition equal to zero, you get a significant decrease in model fit. So the factor loading from inhibition to repairs when it's not set to zero is about 0.33. So that suggests that you can account for about one-third of the variance in people's tendency to produce repairs on the, um, based on individual differences in inhibitory control. Okay. Um, we also got a marginal effect um, with the unfilled or the silent pauses. So um, model fit marginally decreases when the pathway from intelligence um, to silent pauses is set equal to zero. So silent pauses are in some way related to verbal IQ. Um, and, and so this, the, the results from this study um, led us to thinking about whether or not particular types of disfluency are linked to different problems within the production system, right? So if you have a repair disfluency where it's, you say left when you meant to say right, you can sort of figure out, you can make inferences about what went wrong, right? 
the, the wrong lemma was selected and it was articulated, it wasn't caught. But with, with unfilled pauses and repetitions, you don't have any evidence as to what the problem is. And so what, the, what we pursued in this final study here is can we um, ascertain um, what, what's going wrong? And the, and the most obvious thing um, that occurred to us was that possibly silent or unfilled pauses are related to, to memory retrieval, right? So I have to stop my speaking while my brain is retrieving some information and then I can continue um, producing. So in this case, we actually modified um, the task demands to increase the memory load. And the hypothesis of the third study is essentially if unfilled pauses reflect retrieval of upcoming information, then the number of pauses should be related to individual differences in memory ability. Okay. So for this study, we created a test battery um, that, that had several measures of working memory, and we also had several measures of IQ, because remember in the previous study, um, pauses were marginally related to IQ. Um, and so in this study, we had 85 primarily undergraduate students, and the task was, um, it was sentence production, but essentially the participants had to memorize and then repeat um, a sentence back. And we used syntactically complex sentences like, while the woman dressed, the baby that was small and cute played on the bed. And because I'm running out of time, I'll just talk about um, the, the silent pauses, so with respect to the previous findings. But again, the, the procedure was the same. So we first created a model that fit the data well, and then we add pauses in here, and then we do the hierarchical tests. So when we do this, um, we put pauses over here, um, and the prediction was is that potentially unfilled pauses are related to working memory if you have to pause in order to retrieve something from memory. Um, however, we didn't find that, so again, Similar to the previous study, we found that people's tendency to produce um, unfilled pauses is related to verbal IQ. So if you set this pathway equal to zero, model fit significantly decreases. Uh, okay, so the general conclusions on the basis of all three studies um, are that repair disfluencies um, are linked to inhibitory control. We saw this uh, first in terms of the ADHD combined subtype, but we also saw in terms of individual differences um, in typically developing con controls or typically developing individuals. Um, and at this point, we can't really make um, conclusions about, about, um, about whether or not this inhibition effect is related to any of the particular stages, right? It could be that it's a monitoring failure. In some cases, if it's the left versus right, the antonym, you could, you could make an inference that it's due to um, lemma, lemma selection, but the monitoring system, we really just don't know that much about it at this point. Um, across two studies, two different tasks, we saw that silent pauses are linked to verbal IQ. Um, and it's at this point that I get worried that somebody's going to raise their hand and say, well, what is verbal IQ? And I'm going to have to sheepishly say it's whatever uh, verbal IQ tests measure. Um, but I guess sort of the, just the general thing is that the brain's not keeping up with the, with the mouth. Um, so some type of a general, general processing speed issue. Um, and so in future work, what we're really looking for is whether or not we can link the inhibition, the IQ, or the working memory um, results up to particular stages. So is it something that happens in the formulation stage, lemma selection, phrasal processing, or does it have to do with uh, faulty monitoring? Um, and I think that this work is going to be helped um, when we have a better handle on the neural mechanisms of production. So whether or not um, the anterior cingulate, which we know um, from, from behavioral errors that people produce. So if people make an incorrect button press, we, we know that there's error-related negativity. So you get a, a particular ERP component if you make a, a wrong button <coughs> press. We don't really know whether or not you get ACC or <coughs> error-related negativity when you produce a disfluency in language. So, um, so that's another avenue for future work. <coughs>
Um, these are my collaborators um, on all of these studies, um, and thank you for your attention. Um, and I, I, I don't think I need it, but that's fine. Sure. Right. I hope you have plugs then, because my voice is sort of beaming. Um, right. Great talk and good picture of uh, Corley. I really liked it uh, on the previous slide. So, are you pushing a very egocentric, sort of very speaker-oriented idea for what motivates these um, uh, pauses and uh, disfluences? Because, of course, you don't have. Uh, um, do you deny any communicative function to them if it's all about inhibition and stuff? any communicative function to these disclosures. Yeah. Corley's done that. One of Corley's students has done that study comparing monologue and dialogue, and they didn't get differences um, between those two. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, were your subjects uh, English-speaking? Uh, and would you expect any cross-linguistic variation in your results? Thanks. Could you go back to the slide with your um, model, the overview that has all these different tasks feeding into inhibition? That's where my question is. Yes. Oh, no. Uh, further. Yeah, this one. Okay. Um, so there's a um, whole lot of different tasks in this list on the right. And in order to try and figure out in more detail whether the pauses are inhibitory in nature or whether they are reflecting speech planning. I was wondering whether you could say a little bit more about one of the tasks that I happen to know, which is the stop reaction time. I'm assuming this is the Logan yes. method. And so my question then would be whether there is a parametric covariation between the interval that this task estimates as necessary in order to be able to inhibit a response and the duration of the pauses of the individuals. Sorry for the detailed yeah, <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah. So you're exactly hitting on something that we've, that we've looked at, right? So in, not in this one, but in the other one with the working memory, right? You could, you could potentially say that, that the length of the pause should correlate with individual differences in working memory, right? It's not the case. So there's no relationship. I didn't have time to present it, but there's no relationship between the working memory um, abilities and the length of the pauses. Okay. okay, and then your other question is about the stop task. So I don't know if people are familiar with this task. It's essentially a go, no-go task. So they, if the participant sees a circle, they press one button. If they see a square, they, they press another button. And um, on 25% of the trials, there's a tone that sounds, and that means that you need to inhibit the button press. And, and so it's uh, 
basically a variable procedure to find out how much time an individual requires to inhibit that button response. Um, and I have never looked at, at stop signal reaction time and the length of pauses before, um, but that's an interesting possibility. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, can you go back to the example of the sentences that you used in the last experiment? So the really long one, right? Yes. Yeah. So would you think, I mean, how do you dissociate between the requirement of the memory versus the ability to produce complex grammatical structure? So this is while the woman dressed the baby that was small, the cute, played, blah, well, played on the bed. There is a lot of syntactic structure there, right? Yes. And um, as you said, it's related to what you said before, that if you have more syntactic options, that you expect the delay to be greater, right? So how much of that is the, the ability to retrieve that information from the working memory, from their actual ability to construct grammatical information? Uh, okay. good, good question. Um, so in this case, it's just a memorize and repeat. Um, so Presumably, they already have the syntactic structure because they're just repeating what, what they've read. So I think in this, in this particular task where you're just memorizing and repeating, the syntactic processing demands aren't as high, whereas the memory demands, because you have to, have to, re, have to recall it from memory, are high. So it's, so it's a little bit of a difference between the task that has two pictures and a verb. So in that case, you do have to generate what the syntactic structure is, whereas this one, you already have it. <laughs> potentially dissociate syntactic processing from working memory, yeah. To follow up on this same question, this is a garden path uh, sentence, so uh, there should be some processing uh, load involved in parsing it and reparsing it. And uh, you, you, you didn't measure the um, delays, reaction times, only pauses, right? So do you think that they parse it correctly the first time? When they're encoding it, um, we, yeah, we didn't measure. We didn't measure the eye movements as they were reading it. I, I, I do have reaction to, as to how long they how long they read it, um, but I'm not sure what that would tell you in terms of production. Then, but maybe I'm not quite understanding. Uh, the production part uh, is um, a pretty traditional paradigm of uh, uh, getting people uh, to uh, repeat verbatim what they had heard. And uh, uh, you, you can only do that if uh, the, the first uh, reading was there and all the interpretations were there. So you're not just talking about production here if the sentence was not encoded then that's how we catch second language learners. They don't encode the sentence properly. They cannot repeat it. Okay. N yeah, now, now I think I understand the question more. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess I don't, <laughs> sorry. Oh, imaging production is very difficult. I mean, it's, it's yeah. Um, so I, I haven't really thought about how one would go about doing, yeah. doing that. Do you think it's supposed to be like a bunch of To basically have them si silently, yeah, and then, and, then and then report it. Yeah, that's what you would have to do, I think. Because you couldn't, you couldn't have people speaking and trying to record ERPs. Well, what you need is a method. Yeah.